Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and welcome to So Wrong It's Right, a panel show about things which have gone wrong presented by one. <laughs> it's a programme listing everything that's wrong with the world, basically just like the news, with a slightly jauntier theme tune and 100% less George Alagaya. <laughs> Victory can often become defeat and vice versa. In fact, success and failure are so closely related, it's almost impossible to tell which Miller band is which. <laughs> this is a show in which failure is actively applauded, and so with that in mind, please give a big hand to tonight's guests, Rufus Hound, Holly Walsh and Mark Watson. The first round is called Wrong Time, Wrong Place, and in it I'll be asking my guests to delve into their own calamitous pasts in an attempt to out-wrong each other with stories from their own miserable lives. Uh, I'm going to give a point to whoever's failure strikes me as the best. This week's theme is parties. I've got a friend called Mike, and just like the song, you'll always find him in the kitchen at parties, uh, because he's an egg whisk. <laughs> Uh, one of the big problems about going to a party is having to drive home. I went to a do recently where the hosts were so concerned about this, they made us all toss our car keys into a bowl on the table. <laughs> um, and then they insisted everyone stay the night. Although, come to think of it, they did call a cab for me. Um, <laughs> Rufus Hound, what is the worst thing you've done at a party? Well, the worst thing I've ever done at a party uh, was set my hands on fire. <laughs> How? <laughs> That's, well, I mean, surely you need one hand to set the other hand on fire. Not if you've got help. <laughs> Basically, there was a period of my life where, as a party trick, I would take a small amount of lighter fluid, put it in a small pool in the middle of my hand, set light to it. What happens is the lighter fluid starts to burn, you take the other hand and you clap out the flame. <laughs> Having seen this one or two times, people were getting bored of it, so it was really time for me to up the stakes. And I had an idea. What I would do, of course, was cup both hands together, have somebody else pour the lighter fluid in, quite a pool, uh, then open my hands, the lit lighter fluid would drop to the floor, I would clap out my hands with my hands. Thus, done, finished. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, what went wrong was the bloke who was going to light it for me then feared what might go wrong. And so, as I'm trying to convince him it will be fine, the lighter fluid was leaking to the back of my hands. <laughs> so, when he eventually did light it, I opened my hands, the fireball did indeed drop to the floor, but in doing so, set light to the back of my hands. <laughs> now, as you try to clap out the front of your hands, if all that's doing is igniting the back of your hands, <laughs> then rapidly you get yourself into a situation where as you clap out the back of your hands, that reignites the front of your hands. <laughs> So you were stuck in a terrible cycle. Yeah. There's almost um, an argument for not putting lighter fluid on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is just an exploration of stupidity. Well, what I was thinking, Charlie, was that initially the notion of setting fire to your hands was so abstract that it imbued with it heroism. <laughs> then what became apparent was that there was a very good reason heroes don't set their hands on fire. <laughs> Quite an erudite chap. I can't believe you felt the need to impress people by setting fire to parts of your body. If, if you'd met the 16-year-old me, Charlie Brooker, you would realise that was a man who was just waiting for a moustache to replace the personality that was missing. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, Holly Walsh, what about you? Well, I get invited to a lot of fancy dress parties. Just give me a cheer if you hate fancy dress parties. Yeah. <laughs> OK, give me a cheer if you like them. Half enough. See, I, I hate them, but I get very competitive about it. Like, uh, Halloween parties are the worst. We, my friend holds one every year. And uh, one year, I found, I think, what is the best costume you guys? I went uh, in a long white tube, like a full-length white tube, and I cut a hole out just where my face is, and I painted two blue lines across the front, and I went as a pregnancy scare. <laughs> But I, uh, one year, for this same fancy dress party, I set off in good time to get there. And when I arrived, um, it was in a different location to normal. I, I arrived and I knocked on the door and uh, I was dressed as the Grim Reaper. And it turned out I'd got the wrong address. <laughs> and an old woman opened it. Oh. And all I could do was apologise for being early, which is... Uh, <laughs> Exactly the wrong thing to say in that situation. I mean, you could be fulfilling some sort of public service, though, presumably doing that. Did you have a scythe and everything? Did you have? I call? had the works. I'd really gone for it. Did she scream, cry she, out? No, she didn't. She just sort of accepted it, which... Uh, 
Well, that's what I find. When you turn up on an old person's door and tell them it's time for death, they just mutely accept it. (laughs) Although, in fairness, (laughs) this was just an old woman. It wasn't an old mental woman. She was clearly aware it was Halloween. So she opens the door and there's somebody dressed as Grim Reaper. All she's thinking to herself is, oh, well, that's probably just somebody going to a Halloween party. Who's, who's arrived at the wrong <laughs> I, house? This is I the worst it... heckle I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate you to be in an audience for any comedy game. <laughs> Your not, story not... is inconsequential. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a horse walks into a bar. How? How did they allow the horse walk into the bar? <laughs> Mark Watson, what is your party catastrophe? Uh, I let myself down at a party when I was about ten. Um, and it was, um, I just wasn't getting enough attention, basically, for my money. I wasn't, sort of, girls weren't really talking to me. As I say, I was ten, but it's still, I was still old enough to be, sort of, uh, insecure about it. So I thought, what I need is, um, a conversation starter. Um, so I, I began a story that my dad had been uh, killed in a car crash. Um, it was, um, absolutely without substance. I got the idea from the fact that someone at school had been involved in a car accident recently, and it got read out in assembly, and the, everyone was talking to them at break time. And they became almost like a sort of folk hero within the school. Uh, so at this party, finding myself sort of low on attention, I um, played the dead dad card. But um, it was very short-term thinking, because for one thing, my dad was going to be picking me up from the party. <laughs> and um, and he, was only, he was due in about two hours. So almost as soon as I said it, I thought, this is a, an untenable lie. Plus, I knew it was all right among the kids, because they believed it. But if the guy was called Lucio, whose party it was, if his mum and dad were told, then obviously they'd know that I was lying. And so as soon as I'd said it, I thought... I've told one of the most stupid lies of my, um, of my life today. I mean, it worked for about half an hour, because I did get a, You know, everyone was talking to me, and girls were sort of hugging me and things. Um, <laughs> well, but but I, mean, I, knew it, I knew it was a fool's paradise. I knew pretty soon I was going to be in all sorts of trouble. So, but what... I mean, presumably when he turned up, did they think he was a ghost? or I mean, what? I had to, um, I had to do what they call a humiliating climb down. In, in those days, there were no mobiles, of course, so I could have texted my dad and said, to all intents and purposes, you were dead. And um, my dad's a very easygoing bloke. He would have gone with it. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even if I said it to him now, he'd say, fair enough, well, I've had good innings. Um, cause he's, but, As I understand, but, but what appalls me about this story, apart from the fact that you pretended a parent had died, just to, it seems to me, to win the affections of some ten-year-old girls, which yes, sounds like a very Let's not forget I was ten at the time. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> just in um, case anyone's just tuned in, missed my story, but heard that bit. Yeah. Was, I don't recall ever needing icebreakers at a child's party. Perhaps it was just, it's all organised. It's all sit here, play pass the parcel, look at the bloody children's entertainer, let's play lucky dip. There's, there's no conversation over cocktails. It's not like a two, a two Ronnie's sketch when you go to a child's party. I've got a feeling, looking back, that was an over-serious child, yeah. I think I maybe, <laughs> while other people were going thinking, hope I win the pass the parcel, I was thinking, now, nah, what are my openers? What are... <laughs> That's, um, you're all feeble. Um, uh, I'm going to... So I've got a choice, basically, between uh, Rufus setting his hands on fire, Holly turning up and basically convincing an old woman she died, uh, or Mark pretending his own father died (laughs) to win favour at a pathetic child's party. (laughs) I am actually going to... I'm going to give you a point. I'm going to award the point to Holly. Yes. Now... Our next round is called Do Your Worst. It's a test of my guests' capacity for creative wrongdoing. This week I've asked them to pitch me a terrible idea for a new soap opera. Uh, Some soap opera characters stick around so long they seem like real people. Ian Beale, for instance, feels like a close personal friend I've wanted to murder for 20 years. (laughs) Soaps often employ gimmicks to keep themselves fresh. Last year EastEnders did its first live episode. And later this year Emmerdale plans to introduce a special three-dimensional character. Uh, The best soaps tackle issues. Coronation Street details the post-industrial transformation of northern communities. East Enders traces the changing socio-cultural demographic of London's East End. And Hollyoaks fearlessly confronts what happens when nine attractive teenage girls throw a foam party. (laughs) It's so important, sometimes I can scarcely look away. Um, Holly Walsh, what's your soap opera idea? Well... I genuinely think the worst soap opera ever actually exists, which is uh, Doctors. I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is for people who find the plot lines of casualty too taxing. (laughs) So uh, my idea for the worst ever soap opera is uh, called, instead of EastEnders, it's called NoEnders. Every uh, sort of plot line just peters out. Nothing really happens. (laughs) 
It's basically a lot of cockneys getting halfway through a story and then getting distracted. So they'd be like, you worried about what happened to Janine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what happened to her? Oh, I don't... What is that? A bird? <laughs> That's it. But eventually, Just surely... Just on. The thing is, you'd, you'd think that would destroy tension, but eventually, surely, as a viewer, you'd start to wonder what was going to possibly distract them next, and you'd start getting into it, like a prisoner being amused by his own toe. But that's like... <laughs> For example. That, that, that'll be the quote they'll use on it. This is the equivalent of a prisoner being amused by his own toes. Um... I've had worse reviews. <laughs> So it, this, it would just be the worst soap opera ever because all the kind of things that you'd get in a soap opera, like cliffhangers and storylines and things, just wouldn't mean anything. Drama. None of Drama, that. Drama, excitement. So it would just be... I mean, I suppose that is the one advantage. I mean, yeah, at least life ends. Um, <laughs> so it would, just, it would just carry on. That's the one good thing, if you're, if you're just tuning in. That is the one good thing about life. It ends, it definitely ends. Um, <laughs> What am I saying? <laughs> I can't tell people that. I give them false hope. Um, uh, OK, so, so no, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I've, I've gone down some psychodramatic hole in my head here. Yeah. Um, Where, weirdly, you seem to have implied that some people might live forever. <laughs> Not my dad, though. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what's your big idea for a soap? I, first, I'm just... Um, you were genuinely sort of seemed quite shocked and appalled at my party story. <laughs> and, you know, you, because I'd sort of invoked the, sort of, the fictional death of my dad, and yet you've been sort of... M most of this show has just been about your d desire for life to end. <laughs> Partly your own life, and sometimes you imply all human life. <laughs> so the, the thought that I could make you feel like I'd made the tone too bleak is pretty alarming, <laughs> really. Um, it's true that uh, I think... Um, been a lot of medical soaps, and Doctors <laughs> is a famous one just because of the um, extraordinarily untense atmosphere that they create, where basically it starts with someone climbing up a ladder saying something like, I always climb up ladders, nothing ever happens really. <laughs> and then pretty much, I'll just ride this horse, I've never ridden a horse before, shouldn't think anything will go wrong. So basically, as soon as someone does something on Doctors, they'll soon be very badly injured. Um, and the same sort of thing with ER, and there's been a lot of medical, but we don't see much of the people at the fringes of the medical profession. So for me, opticians deserve their own soap. <laughs> I can't understand why this interesting area of uh, life has not been exploited. And, and I, I think, you know, too much in soaps is all, it's all like, oh, broken marriage, this friendship, that, blah, blah, blah. For me, I would, there would be none of this personal life business. It would all be about the very focals and the bifocals. It would all be about the glasses. So in your average episode, someone would come in, do an eye test, they'd then get a prescription, and a couple of days later, they'd come back and pick up the glasses. You don't need anything else. To be fair, that does sound better than The Archers. <laughs> um, uh, that's a very well, dangerous thing to say in a Radio 4 it recording. It does. It does. I mean, they, they, everyone shouts in The Archers. It's just full of farmers shouting in cupboards, <laughs> what it sounds like. Rufus, you're... you're, you're... Well, I, I think I can provide some much-needed excitement into this. <laughs> I give you Priestenders. <laughs> it's a soap opera set in the Vatican. Uh, instead of Albert Square, there's St Peter's Square. Instead of the Queen Vic, there's the Sistine Chapel. And instead of low-level crime and an endless string of marital infidelity, there's magic cannibalism meddling in the affairs of the state and an officially sanctioned policy of covering up child abuse. <laughs> so, so it's a controversial soap. Not as controversial as opticians. <laughs> Now, I know what many of you are thinking. You're thinking there aren't many strong female roles. Well, I don't think I can be blamed for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's, what's going to happen? Is it, is it going to be... I mean, EastEnders always has a traditionally bleak Christmas Day episode. What well, I mean, that's there? it. You know, you've got to have a strong lead character and it doesn't get much stronger than the Pope, a.k.a. Dirty Ben. <laughs> So we've got. So Holly has suggested no enders. <laughs> Mark, you've suggested an optician-based soap, and it's called Opticians! Exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> I should have said that. Well, no, that, no, that lifts it. <laughs> um, and Rufus has gone for priest enders. I think on the basis of the exclamation mark alone, <laughs> I'm going to give the mark the, the point to Mark. There you go. Um...